We'll now call 123190 State of Kansas versus Jerry Campbell. Morning, Your Honors, and may it please the court. Uh, before I begin, I just want to ask to reserve three minutes of rebuttal time. Brandon. Yeah. So this case is procedural history is kind of important to this analysis. So I just want to briefly touch on that. This is the state's petition for review after the case was reversed in the Court of Appeals on a single issue, and that was the erroneous admission of KSA 6455 evidence. And when I say that it has a bizarre history, um, essentially the reason that the state brought a petition to review to this court was that the Court of Appeals entirely ignored uh, a harmlessness analysis on that one issue. Essentially, their opinion found one error, and that was that uh, erroneous admission of evidence, but they didn't conduct a harmlessness analysis. And that essentially flies in the face of precedent set by this court, um, Kansas statute. And effectively, that ruling is that, at least according to that opinion, would be that the erroneous admission of KSA 6455 evidence would amount to structural error. And that's why the state petitioned for review today. Let me ask you a question right from the start. And um, it appears from the briefing that you concede it was error to uh, allow the 455 evidence in, correct? Yes, for the purposes of a uh... For the purposes of this appeal today, um, the state is conceding that that was error. Um, for the most part, I did find the Court of Appeals analysis compelling. Uh, and the Court of Appeals, um, and, and then the Court of Appeals, although they said they were going to conduct um, a probative value versus prejudicial effect analysis in the cumulative error analysis, uh, they never did that. Um, what what is your position on that? Would you, you know, um, in finding that it was air to introduce it, uh, would you also concede, for purposes of this argument anyway, that the prejudicial effect outweighed any probative value, and which would narrow your argument today to, even though uh, the prejudicial effect out um, outweighed that. You still need to then conduct the harmlessness. So I wouldn't concede that, no. Um, part of the harmlessness analysis is weighing the prejudicial effect versus the probative value. And I would say that here, there was almost no prejudicial impact. And we can look to the record and kind of... But when you're talking about the prejudicial impact, and that's what makes this case so confusing, at least for me anyway, because um, I was really trying to... Uh, ferret out <clears throat> the, the confusion of the analysis of the error in the probative value versus prejudice um, and the harmlessness is that when you're talking about harmlessness, the state has the burden of proof um, to show that there's no reasonable probability that the error affected the trial's outcome in light of the entire record. So the fact that it came in, even though the prejudicial value outweighed the probative or the prejudicial effect outweighed the probative value, um, did that change the outcome of the trial? Do you see what I'm saying that it's? I think so. Um, and I guess I would say that, no, it didn't change the outcome of the trial because there are procedural safeguards that were in place and that should have been in place in realistically any case that deals with 6455 evidence. Well, so I guess what I'm saying is I'm just trying to figure out whether you believe, do we need to conduct or remand or, you know, this whole prejudicial effect versus whether that outweighs the probative value? Because I, you know, I have gone through <clears throat> meticulously, um, <clears throat> you know, like the opening and the closing, and three fourths of the opening and closing focuses on 
uh, the May and um, uh, on the on the priors, on yeah. the prior incident. I mean, and the whole case kind of focuses on on these prior crimes. And <clears throat> I see what you're saying, and it is a complicated issue because there's so many different factors and facts in the record at play. That being said, I think the record does conclusively show that there was almost no prejudice. Um, there were those safeguards in place. For example, there was a jury instruction limiting the use of this evidence solely to the purpose of proving intent. But there was also a jury instruction that said, <clears throat> in determining when defendant is in non-exclusive possession of uh, drugs in a car, you can't infer that defendant knowingly possessed it. Um, it, it but here's what you can consider. Number one, whether defendant previously participated in the sale of drugs. And then number two, whether defendant used drugs. And there was no evidence that he used drugs. Um, whether defendant uh, was near the drugs when they were found, but the drugs were found on the passenger side. You know, so it seems like, you know, the jury instruction right there said, number one, here's what you can consider. Yeah, and for what it's worth, I believe that's from the pick, um, but... But it was given to the jury to consider. And I understand that. Um, I understand what you're saying. That being said, the fact... I guess it wasn't in dispute at trial that Mr. Campbell possessed the methamphetamine. And I believe this is the case where... Oh, it wasn't? So the essentially the Court of Appeals opinion was that the state opened the door to put his intent to possess the methamphetamine into dispute by admitting his own statements, his own innocent explanation to law enforcement. And essentially because that was admitted by the state, the state opened the door at least under the Court of Appeals logic to introduce that 6455 evidence. And that's why its admission was error here because the state essentially opened the door for itself to admit this evidence. And beyond that, the possession wasn't necessarily in dispute is more of the distribution as far as I can tell. Um, but had let, he... let me just ask you, uh, once I, I interrupt your train of thought, go ahead and finish your, your oh. sentence. I, I know it's kind of hard to pick up. I, I did the same thing yesterday when I asked the question, I, then I couldn't remember what I was asking. So, so, so I'm sorry, I finish your train of thought. Then I have a question. I guess just on that point, um, had he disputed that he possessed it, essentially the only realistic means of doing that would to be providing another innocent explanation. And under that, the state could have properly admitted the 6455 evidence. Here's, here's my question as it pertains to 6455 evidence. Really, it's designed to only under specific types of exceptions. What it's designed to do is to prevent the state from admitting this kind of propensity evidence that has nothing to do with the case that's before the court or the jury. And that's essentially what it is. And once it is admitted by you that the it's it's an error to let in this prior conviction, these prior acts or what it wrongs and convictions to show, and what it does is show propensity. How how do we assess its impact when did not affect the outcome of of the of the case i mean it, it had to have an effect on the outcome i don't believe it did so essentially okay, tell, tell me why because it's that's that's the danger of all of this so is that it does essentially it, it, mr campbell was charged with uh two counts of distribution of methamphetamine um this evidence was introduced solely to prove the intent and to rebut the truth or falsity of uh, Mr. Campbell's innocent explanation. And the jury was instructed as to those purposes. And it's clear, just given their verdict, that they didn't use this solely as propensity. Instead, Mr. Campbell was acquitted of the distribution charges. He was convicted of simple possession of methamphetamine. And it's clear that the jury 
properly looked at that 6455 evidence and said, yeah, I'm not buying it. I don't see this as proving his intent to distribute on these days. Additionally, we have these two different dates already charged. So the jury already got a picture that he was picked up on, I believe it was September 23rd, 2017 and December 29th, 2017. So we've already got those in the jury's purview without the 6455. And that was never challenged. Those being charged together were never challenged in the district court and they weren't challenged on appeal. But, but well, wasn't the there an innocent explanation? I mean, that was the defense. There was an innocent explanation um, and, and that innocent explanation went to the question of possession, did it not? Yes. And the state was the one who introduced it. And essentially, uh, Mr. Campbell could have introduced that at trial, thus making the admission of 6455 evidence, at least in the Court of Appeals opinion, proper. Well, I, but but that's that's not before us, though, right? The, 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 the Or are you saying because of that, that influences the harmlessness analysis? Essentially, yes. Um, the possession wasn't in dispute. The simple possession wasn't in dispute. It was more the intent to distribute. Well, if the I understand. possession itself was in dispute, then the 6455 evidence would have been properly admitted because Mr. Campbell would have placed that intent to possess into dispute. But the entire argument on appeal is that it wasn't. But it. Counsel, in trying to understand your argument, if I might paraphrase, and then you can tell me if I'm on the right track of what you're trying to say. In order for the evidence to be admitted, the judge is supposed to consider the probative value versus the uh, risk of undue prejudice. So it's probative versus prejudice, and it's a risk of undue prejudice that is weighed. So, but then in considering as an appellate court whether um, whether the prejudicial effect under that standard, which is no reasonable probability that prejudicial effect outweighs the probative value. Are you saying that even though it was error because the undue risk of prejudice outweighed the probative value, that the undue risk was not realized in considering all of the evidence and therefore the um, there is no reasonable probability that the prejudicial effect outweighs the probative value. So I would say there is no real risk that the prejudicial effect, at least at the district court level, outweighed the uh, probative value. And that's just given at the district court level, um, there was the innocent explanation. Obviously on appeal, that was a big issue because the state admitted that innocent explanation through one of its witnesses. So the district judge is looking at a future risk and an appellate court is looking at the totality of the evidence retroactively to see how it all played out. Essentially, yes, because at the time it ruled on the 6455 motion, the district court had pictures, essentially, a snapshot of the case given by counsel for both sides as to what was actually in dispute. But back on appeal, when we look back on this case, we see that the state opened the door to admit that evidence, that it wasn't actually in dispute because the state admitted that. Why, why does that? I guess I'm confused as to why. Aren't we talking about the, it, the, meritory, the merits of the decision to admit or not admit, which is not before us, as yeah. I understand it? Yes, is that right. And I, essentially, I tried to avoid that, but it kind of it all bleeds together for an issue like this. How does it? Uh, can you articulate how it bleeds together? Yeah. So essentially, with sixty four fifty five evidence, we have these limited purposes that it can be admitted for. When we look back on appeal and see, hey, that wasn't an actual purpose that it should have been admitted for, then we have to assess whether or not it was harmless for it to still be admitted. 
I guess, if that makes Are, sense. Is your argument that it could be harmless because it could have been admitted on a different grounds? No, not necessarily. I think it was... And once it's erroneously admitted, which I understand you've conceded to yes. for purposes of this appeal, isn't isn't the harmlessness analysis pretty straightforward? And it's just a, it's just our standard. Yes, it's the one from the statute. And as I understand it, that's your primary complaint here is that that should have been done and it wasn't. Yes, and it should have been found harmless just given the totality, the context of the case in the record. Just looking at the outcome and looking at the evidence presented at trial, it's clear that this error was harmless and the jury didn't give it any undue weight. It's clear that they weren't persuaded by it, and it's clear that they didn't use it solely for the purposes of propensity. Um, and seeing that I'm out of time, I'll stand for any other questions. Thank you. May it please the court, Jerry Campbell appears through counsel, Casper Shire, Kansas Appellate Defender Office. <clears throat> this court should affirm the Court of Appeals reversal of Jerry's conviction, convictions based on the improper admission of KSA 6455 evidence. Would you agree that, um, that the Court of Appeals erred in not conducting a harmlessness? I, I agree that they should have put in a, a sentence or a paragraph explaining why the error in this case is reversible. They should have done that. Okay, and what what is your position on harmlessness? That uh, this error is absolutely reversible because the state has not and cannot prove harmlessness. Um, so so let me um, let me ask you this. When I'm looking at it. Um, he was charged with a count of, from September, a count of possession of methamphetamine with intent to distribute, two counts of possession of paraphernalia from December, uh, same thing, um, and uh, diazepam with intent to distribute. And then he was, and then all this evidence came in about prior distribution. And I've gone through the record and it was all about, you know, May and July distribution, distribution, uh, money, uh, scales, baggies, you know, distribution, distribution in the past. And it's just full of all this distribution from May and July. And then the jury only convicted him of a lesser included possession of meth from September and two counts of possession of paraphernalia. And from December, a lesser included possession of meth. So, um, so when you say that the, I mean, isn't there some merit to the state's argument that it's harmless? No. Okay. So tell me why. First, as your honor has laid out very well, I think a, a, a lot of this trial, opening, closing evidence was about the improperly admitted evidence. Second, the split verdict shows that this was a really close case. It shows that the jury rejected the uh, the most serious charges. It shows that the jury returned lesser included on those charges and that they fully acquitted on some charges. And the really critical fact that I see, Jerry was acquitted of each and every charge that did not touch on methamphetamine in some way. The charges that he was convicted of all involve methamphetamine, whether that's simple possession or whether that's possession of the paraphernalia with intent to use it to distribute methamphetamine. He was acquitted of the buprenorphine charges. He was acquitted of the alprazolam charges. And I apologize if I'm butchering uh, the I pronunciation there. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> that, I was kind of baking on that, to be honest, Your Honor. And the 6455 evidence was all specific to methamphetamine. Yes. Um, the the it was at least to my memory, it was it was it was I know it was at least two counts of possession of methamphetamine with the intent to distribute. So it, essentially, the jury is looking at two different car stops. In the first one, Jerry is not the registered driver of the vehicle or the registered owner of the vehicle. Um, he's not the only person that drives it, and there's evidence of that. Um, 
after he stopped, he turns the car keys over to somebody else who refuses to consent to a search of the car. There are absolutely reasons to believe that what was found in that car might have belonged to somebody else. But what about the fact that um, there was a card for the bail bonds person with his case number with the drugs right. on the uh, non-exclusive possession? Right. And that was the second case. Right. That was the December stop. Right. And, uh, you know, I think all that shows is that somebody bonded Jerry out of jail. Um, but it was with the drug. Yes, it was. So I, I think that could just as easily show that whoever bonded Jerry out of jail was in possession of that methamphetamine. And Jerry didn't bond himself out. Okay. And then on the other one, it was exclusive possession. I disagree, Your Honor, because Jerry was not the only one who had access to that car. It wasn't his car. And he wasn't the only one that drove it. And that evidence was in the record. So that so the definition of exclusive possession is not who's in the car right then? When when somebody car else has a right of access or control over the car. Oh, okay. I I think that could lead a jury to believe, well, we don't know that this was Jerry's. This may have been the car owners or it may have been somebody else that was driving the car. Okay. I also want to ask one question that opposing counsel brought up. Do you agree that possession wasn't in dispute? In dispute is a term of art. Uh -huh. So in a sense, I do. Because typically when we're talking about in dispute for the purposes of 6455, that means can the state admit priors to, to prove this point? And no, I don't think he put... I don't think he put his intent in dispute for that purpose, either for simple possession or um, oh, I think I misunderstood. I okay, but oh, so he was talking about the intent to possess wasn't in dispute. I thought he meant that your client was not uh, disputing that he possessed. Jerry's Jerry did not take the stand and present any evidence at all. He didn't even put on an opening statement. Okay. So I don't think he put anything. Okay, in yeah, I think I misunderstood but, that okay. purpose. But his counsel did argue to the court, "We are not contesting possession or int intent to possess or distribute." That was the argument that was made, was it not? It, the closing argument was focused on the burden of proof and reasonable doubt. But even the argument made to the court when the court was considering this, the the four fifty five motion, that was the argument. Correct. Am I right about that? I, I think the argument, I, I would have to look at it again, to be honest, Your Honor, but my memory of the defense was that the state can't prove its case. Right. And that's going why to put the state to its burden of proof. That's that's why at the at the argument on the evidence, the defense position was, look, there's no grounds to admit these prior acts it, yes, because yes. we have not put intent to possess or intent to distribute in issue. Right. That's exactly right, Your Honor. Yeah. All we're doing is is holding the state to its burden. Is it of proof. fair? And so then my follow up, is it. Does it make sense to allow a defendant to make that argument below and then turn around on appeal and say, well, wait a second, um, we were harmed because this led the jury to conclude that we had an intent to possess or intent to distribute. Do you see the contradiction or at least potential contradiction there? I, I, I see the problem you're getting at, Your Honor. Here's, here's what I'll say. I, I think they're two different questions. And I think we're all in agreement in this case at this point that the, this, this evidence should not have come in. That was error. The danger is that the jury is going to use that for our propensity purposes. And... But do we know whether the error is that it uh, was simply unnecessary or improper? Was it redundant or improper to admit? It was improper. And this court's case law says that when, when the accused does not put his intent at issue by offering some sort of defense that opens up, the 6455 evidence, it is improper to put on that evidence to prove something. Um, it, it, essentially, it's door opening, right? If the, if, if the defendant takes a stand or puts on some other evidence, like in Rosa, 
that, well, yeah, that methamphetamine was in my house. I, I recognize that was my house, but I didn't know it was there. Well, then it becomes totally fair game to put on this propensity evidence to say, well, yes, you did. Where your defense is, the state can't prove its case. The state has not met the burden of proof. It is not fair game. So in the harmlessness analysis, would, wouldn't it make sense to limit your position to whether or not the state made its case? The state has to prove that the outcome would not have been different if this evidence had not been admitted. That's what the, that's what the reversibility analysis right. is about. But, but so, are we limited by the way in which your, your client argued the issue below to simply asking, was the evidence the state presented essentially sufficient to support the charges? No. A showing of harmlessness requires much more than, than a simple showing of sufficiency. Typically, it would. I agree. I'm just trying to get at the same sort of oddity of, which I think we're in agreement of, which is... The, the analysis on the merits of the admission of the evidence turns on whether or not the defendant opened the door. It's a right. good way to say it. I like the way you said that. It makes sense. And if the defendant's saying, look, I never opened the door, doesn't that, or I guess, tell me why that shouldn't constrain your arguments about harmlessness later on. Because as as you pointed out earlier justice this jury was it's expressly instructed that hey when you're when you're considering non-exclusive possession you can consider essentially the priors you can consider prior sales so the jury was told they could think about all of this stuff in determining whether or not jerry was guilty of simple possession or not so especially when you get acquittals on all of the counts that don't touch on methamphetamine. And the jury is told, well, you can consider these prior methamphetamine convictions to consider whether or not when you're when you're trying to decide whether or not he possessed this methamphetamine. I, I don't see how you can come to the conclusion that the state has proven that no other result was possible absent putting on evidence of priors that never should have come on in the first place. Is there ever a scenario when it's harmless? Uh and what I'm talking about is propensity of, uh, of uh, error to allow propensity evidence under 6455. What's the hurdle? I mean, we have a hurdle that's pretty high. Can it ever be cleared? I, I, in your mind, you, you started your argument by saying the state can't show it's harmless. Yes. Is that included in that calculus? That you, it can't be or the hurdle is so high it's rarely cleared? Or where are you at with that? I would say rarely is a, is a good place to put it. And I, the only reason I don't say never is because I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's a case out there um, where, where the evidence would be so overwhelming that um, admitting priors wouldn't have made a difference. But this is certainly not that case, especially not given the split verdict that the jury returned. There is every reason in the world to believe that if the jury had not been uh, that if the state had not been piling on with evidence of uh, months earlier methamphetamine convictions, uh, the jury would have returned acquittals uh, just as they did for the other controlled substances. Can you, can you help me understand the limiting instruction um, limited to 450, the jury's consideration of the 455 evidence to intent and to prove the truth or the falsity of the defendant's innocent explanation. So was the innocent explanation a defense that was introduced at this at the trial by the defense? Not by the defense, Your Honor, by the state. The and state said there was an innocent explanation for yes, and that his was, possession? I, I thought the innocent explanation was from his statement to law enforcement that other people are in this car all the time. It it, it was probably them because it, it wasn't me and it wasn't the girlfriend. Exactly. But it was the state's choice to admit that evidence in its case in chief. Jerry did not put on that evidence. And he didn't have to. Obviously, he has the right not to testify. He gets to pick his defense. And that, I think, was one of the problems that the Court of Appeals noted here, which is 
essentially the state got to pick Jerry's defense for him and then rebut it with these priors. And um, again, it wasn't the defense elected by it wasn't the defense selected by Jerry. It was the defense selected for Jerry by the state. And I see my clock winding down. I did want to touch on the uh, two issues I had on the cross petition just very briefly. Um, first, the state should not have gotten a chance here to uh, relitigate a suppression motion that it lost. It shouldn't have gotten a second bite at the apple just because it didn't put on the evidence that it realized it should have the first time. Second, uh, they aired by lumping Jerry in during voir dire with somebody who walks up to a court reporter and slaps her in front of a dozen witnesses in a misguided attempt to explain the presumption of innocence to the jury. And uh, we, we endorsed Judge Green's uh, dissenting opinion on that point. We asked this how, court- How much does the instruction on the presumption of innocence that the jury kind of overcome Learn about the inquiry in voir dire? I don't believe it does, Your Honor. And I see I'm out of time, but I'd certainly like to answer the question. I'm wondering your response. Um, this was a case about reasonable doubt. That was Jerry's defense. So anything that waters down that presumption of innocence, anything that you know signals to the jury that, yeah, even though even though uh, Jerry has a presumption of innocence, we know that even really guilty people where we have absolutely overwhelming evidence rely on that presumption too. In a case this close and in a case where the defense is reasonable doubt, that can't be harmless, Your Honor. I'm gonna I'm push back on that a little bit because how was the presumption of innocence misstated? I think it was an inappropriate hypothetical, but how was the presumption of innocence misstated by that hypothetical? Well, Your Honor, I think the, the key difference between the majority and the, cent, the, the dissent here um, is that the majority is, is looking at the logical accuracy of the hypothetical. And I, you know, I can't disagree that the hypothetical logically states what the presumption of innocence is. I think what the dissent does correctly is say, yes, but what we're really interested in is what effect does this have on the jury? And if the effect that this has on the jury is to water down the presumption of innocence and to edge the jury toward an emotional conviction, which for the reasons laid out in the dissent is exactly what happened here, that is error, Your Honor. And so are you from, okay, like how is it different from Robinson? In Robinson, which was a death penalty case with pretrial publicity, um, assuming the prosecution did a horrible or bad job presenting a case and you had serious doubts that the state met its burden, how would you vote? Or would you vote to acquit? There, we said that didn't alter the burden of proof or undermine the presumption of innocence. And I think one of the things that makes this case different is we can see in the record that the jurors were, in fact, confused by this hypothetical because the prosecutor follows up by saying, so if we presented no evidence and you had to return your verdict right now, what would it be? And the jurors are saying, I don't know. I, that's a tough one. I'm, I'm not sure how I would return my verdict there. And they had to be prompted on the, the, the correct answer before they got there. So, and, and Judge Green pointed out this out in his dissent as well. We can see in real time how this hypothetical is leading the jury off course. But it's yeah. also accurate that presumptions can be overcome. Presumptions have to be overcome with proof provided beyond a reasonable doubt. Yes. Yes, but um, this particular hypothetical is, is lowering the bar before the trial starts. And, and that's the problem. That Why have. isn't just it just simply demonstrating that a presumption can be overcome. There are other ways to make that point that would not have watered down Jerry's presumption of innocence in the way that this hypothetical did. 
make a difference that the prosecutor didn't ask for um, ask for a confirmation that uh, in the example the person was guilty. That make a difference. That that she didn't follow up by saying this person is guilty, right? To get to get some kind of a uh, uh, vote from the juror. I I commitment I, didn't ask. She didn't ask for a commitment from. No, the jury. she didn't ask for a commitment. And if she had, that would have been a a separate problem. So we don't have that here, uh, but we do have a hypothetical which is you know, lumping Jerry together with somebody who is clearly guilty and is irrationally insisting on a trial anyway. And that is, that is, that is watering down the presumption of innocence. And I, I, I know that I'm well over time. So if there are no more questions, I'll conclude by asking this court to uh, affirm the reversal of Jerry's convictions based on 6455. Uh, and to reverse the Court of Appeals on the uh, three remaining issues. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honors. I want to touch on a few points that were raised by Mr. Schreier here. Um, I just want to address the 6455 issue briefly since I spent the majority of my time and I believe Mr. Schreier spent the majority of his addressing that. And I do want to touch on the, the cross petition as well. Um, so essentially we do have that instruction about the constructive possession um, that you can use prior bad acts to show constructive possession. However, the jury, again, already saw two separate instances where he had where it was alleged that he had uh, possessed methamphetamine and those were the charges from this case those were september and december so adding another two dates to that i don't think does any more harm as propensity evidence okay so i don't really concerned. understand that argument because that says whether defendant previously participated in the sale of drugs and you're talking about the current charges so the you know, in the instruction says in deciding in this case, whether, you know, um, the defendant is in non-exclusive possession. So I'm not really understanding how that. I, I the, guess my point is. You know, this was a, this case combined the September and December charges together. So those are the charged um, crimes in this case. Those are not previous. Yes. And I guess my point is when you see something happen twice, when you see something happen once, you can kind of brush it off as an accident. Maybe it just got left in there by the registered owner of the vehicle. But when you see it happen twice in the same car with the same driver, the jury's already got this question. Okay, why does this keep happening? So we have those just in the charges and that was never disputed. But then we have this 6455 evidence, and I don't think that adds anything else to it. Well, why did the state want the 6455 evidence? So I couldn't tell you. Um, that much is not in the record. Well, I well, can read the record, the, and I have a pretty and, strong sense of why the state was. As far <laughs> as the proving intent to distribute and um, rebutting that innocent explanation that the state admitted. So that would be a that pretext, would be the wasn't it? Not as far as I'm aware. Well, but and I don't mean to, I don't mean to allege bad least. motives necessarily. However, it seems clear that the state knew that it did not need to put uh, intent to possess or distribute at issue. So, it, my understanding is this case was tried prior to this court's decision in Brazil, which clarified the admissibility of sixty four fifty five evidence in drug possession and distribution cases before that everything was a little muddy and confusing and so now we have this and I, mean, I would say there was no there was no improper motive for the admission i think it was and i'm not suggesting that but i am suggesting that it appears to me that the defense i mean 
just in a run of the mill case, if I'm a prosecutor, I, I used to be a prosecutor. If the if the defendant says, I just want to put you to your proof, it's like, well, that's a gift from a prosecutor's perspective. Um, and here it looks like you were like, that's not enough. Well, I, I want 6455. I think a too. large part of it was one of the charges dealt with a weight of methamphetamine that was like 0.1 grams. And it was still charged at distribution. So the state didn't have any benefit of the presumption by weight as far as distribution goes. So in other words, it was a weak case. So you needed the distribution evidence. wasn't the strongest. I'll I'll concede that much. Um I, I'm just pushing on a little bit on I, I think this it's issue a, of doesn't doesn't the way and I asked your opposing counsel this about the way it was argued below could cut against the defendant's possession on appeal. But but I think the, there's an opposite argument to be made that it, it really cuts against the state here because I just it just looks like the state really was seeking propensity evidence because and the, the 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 rationale that we need this to rebut the innocent explanation which we don't even have to put in front of the jury it, it looks suspicious put it that way and I understand um I guess my possession here is that without, in every instance where it's determined that KSA 6455 evidence is erroneously admitted, there needs to be a proper harmlessness analysis. And I think this case has a strong argument in favor of harmlessness, just looking at the record and looking at the verdict returned by the jury and looking at the evidence that was presented. And that's why I'm here today just Essentially, the Court of Appeals didn't do that analysis, and I would prefer for erroneous admission of evidence not to become structural error in the, in the well, I prefer for that not to become precedent. If we so. agree with you that the Court of Appeals made a legal error by not conducting that an analysis, what, do you, what is your request to us from that point forward? I guess my request would be for an actual harmlessness analysis to be done, whether it's by this quarter, if it's sent back to the Court of Appeals to do that. Um, it Procedurally, I'm not sure how that would work, but okay. it makes no difference to me. I would just like that analysis done. And so seeing I have no time left, um, I just want to conclude asking this court to reverse the Court of Appeals reversal on the 6455 issue and affirm all of its rulings as to the other issues um, in the court's consideration today in the cross petition. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to both counsel for your arguments. The court will take this matter under advisement.